Our next presentation, this is really a, a, a special time in the, this symposium for me to really introduce uh, some of the, we like to call them the kids, but the, the fellows who've come through our training program, who have spent some dedicated, it's been a good amount of dedicated time in research, um, trying to answer some of the questions and how this can translate to the clinic. You know, it's always a story can be told. It was uh, two or three years ago, I was at the Perinatal Service of Legacy, uh, the SOGI conference, I think it was in Washington, D.C., and we were talking about, I was in a number of lectures, uh, listened to a number of lectures, talking about clinical trials. And it really just seemed at that, that per, per time, the take home was that recruitment to clinical trials was anemic. Um, and, and poorly understood, and maybe just getting the word out. And I, I had a conference call with Dr. Escoval shortly thereafter, and we talked about how we could potentially put together all the trials into a paper so that all can, everybody can understand to see where we are and, uh, and how far we really need to go. And I, you know, I thought about who can I assign to this. It's always good to delegate to people a lot smarter than me, and my kids are, the kids are a lot smarter than I am. Um, and I said, I got the guy for you, uh, Jesus. Uh, Bill, Bill Morano um, is a surgical fellow, uh, was a surgical fellow in my lab, and he's a surgical ecologist to be. He's just coming, I was on the interview scare, uh, trail right now, who had an, has had an enormous and produ very productive time in my laboratory, and um, probably, a, probably the most productive as it stands right now, except for Dr. Kalili, you'll hear about later. Um, and he is, uh, he, he went to the SOGI meeting in Paris, and he actually gave a presentation there looking at uh, the clinical trials for perinatal service malignancies. Uh, and I really tasked him with talking about what, what, what are the clinical trials now? Where are we for appendicil cancer and mucin-producing colon cancer? And uh, Bill's going to give us a synopsis, and I'm um, looking forward to hearing his talk. And uh, Bill, thank you very much for being here. Um, I want to thank Dr. Bound for the opportunity to share a stage with some pretty amazing speakers. Uh, he knows I'm going to be telling people about the elite company I now share going forward after this. Uh, I have no financial disclosures to report, but as a, a PGY6 surgical resident and potentially a future father of two, I am open for business. Uh, so just a brief overview. So, uh, you know, I, I, explain, I didn't want to go through all the trials that we went through in the paper that Dr. Bound mentioned because it was. Uh, a lot, actually, which is encouraging. Um, so I wanted to pick out some highlights, go through a little bit of the history of these trials uh, as they pertain to the NCCN guidelines and some of the more recently published ones as well. Um, so that's kind of where we'll start. We'll head into the international trials, uh, some examples of the U.S. trials, and then briefly the ideal trial, which is a lofty topic. Uh, just for all the patients out there and some of the, the younger uh, doctors, so when we talk about clinical trials, the FDA really highlights five different phases, starting with phase zero, which is really the physiologic effects of a drug or, or therapy that we're using, all the way up to stage four, which is a, uh, phase four, which is after FDA approval, when you're really targeting large groups. And each step is kind of testing safety and efficacy in larger and larger groups, combining possible combination of drugs as well as randomization of patients to you know one side or the other. Um, so the NCCN guidelines for specifically for appendiceal cancer and pseudomyxoma peritonei don't really exist. Uh, they're kind of lumped into the colon cancer uh, guidelines because as we talked about uh, to a large extent, they're very rare. Uh, so if you kind of look all the way down here, uh, this is where cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC get mentioned. Um, it, it recommends in these patients referring them to a high volume center for potential CRS and HIPEC uh, as long as they're not obstructed from the disease. It also recommends way down there in the bottom in the very smallest print, uh, participation in clinical trials, which is really uh, what we need going forward to kind of validate some of these treatments that we're using. So let's look at the history of this. Uh, as Dr. Escobel already kind of mentioned, thankfully confirming the dates I used here, uh, that the development of intraperitoneal perfusion began kind of in the, the late 70s. Uh, separately, intraperitoneal chemotherapy and hyperthermia were developed and eventually kind of came together uh, in the later 70s. And the first patient was treated with HIPEC for recurrent PMP in 1979. Uh, there were a series of phase one and two trials in the 80s, uh, including one by Dr. Sugarbaker, Dr. Zim, and Dr. Colombo, which kind of validated some of this treatment early on. Uh, in a variety of, of, of disease processes, including ovarian, gastric, uh, colorectal, and appendiceal. Um, 
However, the NCCN guidelines uh, do cite a, a lot of retrospective data in their support of CRS and HIPEC when going through this. Um, one trial, which was pretty crucial to the NCCN guidelines and their recommendations, was by Verwal et al. in the Netherlands, uh, which was a randomized perspective phase three trial, which took, took place in the late 90s. Used 105 patients were, were uh, entered into this study, uh, eventually using 44 in the control arm, which was systemic chemotherapy, uh, and 49 in the cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC. Uh, they used a variety of origins, including colon, appendix, and rectum. What it demonstrated was uh, significantly improved survival in these patients in those with less than five sites involved. And so that kind of confirms what we know in those with uh, less disease involvement uh, do a little bit better with this. And especially in those with R0 and R1, which is microscopic uh, margins resection. It demonstrated a, a doubling of the median survival compared to the control arm as well. So that sort of kind of uh, got us going with, with this. There were a couple other uh, clinical trials, specifically in the NCCN guidelines, uh, by Yan and all and Olivier Glenn, uh, that took place in the early 2000s as well, which uh, gave some similar results that kind of helped push us forward into this, uh, this phase. Um, so with that in mind, we decided to kind of look, like Dr. Baum mentioned, we decided to kind of look back through from these papers on uh, what trials have been published since that time. Where do we stand now over the last, you know, now almost 20 years? Uh, and what we found was, you know, excluding a few smaller um, trials that were focusing on sort of toxicity and database accrual, uh, we found really only 14 clinical trials have been published in about the last 18 years, including the few that I mentioned already. Uh, I'll get to the Protease 7 trial, which is an abstract form only, but I don't think any conversation about clinical trials would be complete without discussing that as well. Uh, and seven of these uh, were specifically investigating non-ovarian malignancies, so Dr. Richard has a pretty good set of data to go by. So we looked at where these trials are taking place um, internationally. We looked at the clinicaltrials.gov, the UJUST CT, and the UMIN C uh, CTR uh, registry specifically, kind of looking at an international scope as best we could for where these trials were. And what you see um, is colorectal still sort of predominates um, in all the trials ongoing. Now, there is some overlap into appendiceal as well in that grouping. Uh, and then the, the people uh, investigating gastric cancer kind of points more towards China, Japan, Korea as well. Uh, where they have a much higher prevalence of gastric cancer. Uh, although you know, an, an ovarian cancer obviously is still prevalent and appendiceal still is represented pretty well. As far as where they're taking place, as I mentioned, China has a large volume of, uh, China and the United States represent the largest number of clinical trials that are currently ongoing uh, and accruing patients actively. Uh, and what you notice as you go through here, uh, where's this pointer? So the ones with an asterisk next to them represent uh, countries in which the trial takes place uh, across their borders. And so what that highlights, and no more, uh, no place is that clear than Dr. Sugarbaker's conference in Paris this last year, was that this is an international effort and people are, are crossing borders into other countries in order to help accrue patients in order to get, to get the adequate data to show how effective this may be. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Produce 7 trial. Uh, so this was a randomized multicenter phase three trial that took place in France across a number of high pec centers. Uh, by Francois Quinet and Olivier Glahan. Uh, and it accrued 270 patients with peritoneal carcinomatosis from colorectal origin, those with a PCI score of less than 25. And what they did, they had a very pretty straightforward but though lofty goal of comparing cytoreductive surgery with systemic chemotherapy to CRS and the addition of HIPEC to see what role HIPEC played in these patients. Uh, so unfortunately, the, the outcome was not necessarily what people expected. Uh, it didn't show a survival, there was no clear survival benefit with the addition of HIPEC, except in those patients with a moderate disease burden, which is a P, which they represented as a PCI score of 11 to 15. But what it did do was also confirm sort of what we already had data for, was that systemic chemotherapy and cytoreduction are really standard, standard of care at this point for patients with peritoneal carcinomatosis. So it, it was a really ambitious trial, and I think it, it kind of set us on the right path for a continued process at this point. So I, we've already heard about both these trials. I'm glad I got sent the um, schedule a little bit early so that I knew not to kind of go into these again. Um, but these are the, the two trials that are ongoing at Penn and at the Roger Williams Cancer Center with Dr. Katz. Uh, just sort of, I, I think, are important, although, you know, the one at Penn is not a intraperitoneal therapy. I think they're important to highlight because the Immunotherapy is quickly becoming the fourth tenet of uh, cancer care, along with surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. So I think you're going to see a lot more of these trials uh, kind of developing over the next, you know, next year, 10, 10 years or so. Um, 
So the Levine can't, uh, just uh, like I said, I want to highlight just a few uh, rather than going into all of the 50 trials that we you know, kind of went through in the paper. Uh, the Levine Cancer Institute, which is down in Charlotte, uh, they have a, a single arm phase two study of 39 patients with peritoneal metastases from appendiceal origin. Uh, and they're looking at nintedinib, uh, metastatic appendiceal carcinoma. These are for patients who largely failed systemic therapy, unfortunately, uh, with 5-FU-based therapy. This is a VEGF inhibitor which has been shown to be effective in both uh, lung and ovarian cancer. And uh, so they were hopeful that they could apply this as well here. Uh, again, this is currently ongoing. The Icarus trial is a trial based out of Sloan Kettering in New York uh, by Garrett Nash, a colorectal surgeon, who uh, is, again, still accruing patients now. It's a randomized phase two trial. Uh, they're looking for up to 220 patients. And essentially, what they want to do is compare a cytoreductive surgery with early post-operative intraperitoneal chem chemotherapy and HIPEC itself. Uh, so patients here will be stratified based on appendiceal or colorectal origins, so kind of trying to separate out those two disease, disease origins. As we know, they behave differently. Uh, and they also want to uh, stratify based on their uh, exposure to prior systemic therapy. Patients will undergo intraoperative randomization to either receive HIPEC or EPIC uh, after a complete site of reduction. And their, disease, uh, their endpoint will be disease-free survival up to three years. Uh, the University of Kansas Medical Center uh, kind of decided to take a different approach to this. There are a number of different protocols across the country. You'll see, if you, you know, depending on the, the uh, hospital you go to, and what they use for chemotherapy in HIPEC. Uh, so University of Kansas decided to look at mitomycin C and melphalan. Mitomycin C is generally what we use here and is the, the most commonly used intraperitoneal chemotherapy across the country. Uh, they wanted to see if this was truly the most effective one, and, the, and they wanted to look at the toxicity profile of both of these drugs in comparison. Lastly, I, I think this is one uh, we didn't go into too much in the paper Dr. Baum mentioned, but I think is going to be something that will pop up more and more. Uh, so PIPAC is essentially pressurized, aerosolized intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Uh, it's used in the neoadjuvant setting. It's used in uh, adjuvant setting, and it's used as palliative therapy, uh, mostly in, in Europe at this point. Um, although I did read a couple articles about potential places that may be opening trials in the U.S., although nothing kind of concrete yet, so I didn't want to discuss them too much. Um, these are phase one and two trials, and so they're currently ongoing. There are a number of them. So lastly, what is the ideal study? Uh, including everything Dr. Esquivel mentioned, there are a number of variables that go into this, including the disease origin, um, specifically looking at you know the heterogeneity of uh, penicillin cancer itself. Ideally, we'd be able to compare systemic therapy, which was the old standard of care, to uh, cytoreductive surgery with systemic therapy, and then in the C group, uh, comparing cytoreductive surgery, HIPEC, and systemic therapy, uh, and then follow these patients out and see, you know, and cross them over if necessary for treatment. Lastly, for patients, where can you find out about these? Because I see the NCC and guidelines recommend is everybody should be enrolled in clinical trials for these. Uh, so ACPMP, as Jim mentioned, has a, a great listing of some of these trials. The PMP PALS network has its own listing. Uh, the clinicaltrials.gov, which is a little more difficult to navigate, but is a, a great place, source of information. CenterWatch, similarly. And then sp speak to your doctor. Uh, it's a small community. It's international. And it's current. It's always changing. And so you know, the, the surgeons and the medical oncologists who are involved in this are constantly educating themselves on what the newest treatments are. So speak to your doctor. If they don't know, they can certainly point you to somebody who will. That's all I have. Thank you.